I told Dr. Anderson, set the bar low, because I can only go up from there, but uh, it's good to be home. I feel right at home at Bridgeway. I've been here a few times. I wish it wasn't such a long commute. I would be here more, but I know that you're talking about this theme of of what it means to be the church, this little series of what it means to be the church. And I was talking to one of my neighbors about that, and uh, Spanish is her first language. And she said, sometimes we just make it too complicated. She said, uh, like you, theologians, they talk about Jesus as the incarnation. And she said, but in Spanish, when you order your burrito con carne, it means with meat. And that's what Jesus is God with meat. Uh, God putting skin on to show us what God is like in the flesh. Con carne. And now what it means to be the church is to be the body of Christ to the world. To flesh out that love. Amen? And so maybe that's the sermon. But I, I got a little more time. So I, I think, uh, you know, I think we have to begin by saying we haven't always lived out that vocation well. We haven't fleshed out God's love all that well. Um, I know growing up, I grew up in the Bible Belt in East Tennessee. I grew up Methodist. And the Methodists, you know, I don't know if you know, the Methodists have the fire, literally the, the picture of the fire on the hymnal, on all their icons, on the altar, because it started as a fiery revival, right? It started with a fire of justice with Wesley and others that were slavery abolitionists. They were folks that believed in advocating for the most marginalized, right? John Wesley said, if I find money in my hands, I get rid of it as quick as I can before it corrupts my heart. John Wesley was a wild man, but I was talking to the Methodist bishops, and I said, I guess the question is, if John Wesley was still alive, would he be Methodist? <laughs> like, they didn't like that joke, uh, DA, they didn't like that joke. But John Wesley, who said, if I die with more than $10, may every person call me a liar and a thief because I betrayed Jesus and I betrayed the poor. He was a wild man, rode horseback, doing revivals. That's why they had to fire. But the Methodist church I grew up in, Still needed a rekindling of the fire, if you know what I'm saying. So I kind of got bored. And then I was in high school, and there were these new students. Uh, and my friend told me they were Pentecostals. I was like, tell me about that. He was like, oh, man, they like speaking tongues and stuff. They believe in miracles and healing. I was like, man, that sounds interesting. So one of my Methodist friends dared me to go over and ask these guys if they speak in tongues. And I did it. I went up to their lunchroom table. I said, yeah, I heard y'all are Pentecostals. You speak in tongues. And they said, yeah, come on, come to church. So I went, oh, my Lord. This little Methodist boy went to that Pentecostal church, and I got born again. I, I, I went to the altar, and uh, I mean, I, I felt like God is alive in the world. I saw people healed. I saw miracles and prophecies. And then I also, I mean, I, you know, they said, you got to get rebaptized because that sprinkling thing the Methodists do, it's, you got to get under the water, son. You got to get born again. So I got born again. And then, you know, they started doing these things like we had this thing called Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames. Oh, my Lord. It was this thing where... We did skits on stage, right? I mean, skits are scary enough, but these were like real bad skits where the, you're driving the bus and the bus would crash and the demons would come and drag all the kids that didn't know Jesus to hell. And my friend's dad was the devil and he was good. <laughs> and they would give an altar call and We'd all get born again. Even the pastor and some of the elders gave their life again. You know, you, you, it literally kind of scared the hell out of you. You know, it was, it was scary. And there came a time where I had to spit out some bones from the Pentecostal church. There was things that I still embrace. I still believe in miracles. I believe in the movement of the Holy Spirit. But I also began to see I didn't choose Jesus because I was scared to death of hell or because I wanted mansions in heaven, I chose Jesus because he's good, because he's beautiful, because he's God's love made flesh. So I had to keep going back to Jesus, right? Even in spite of the, the funky things I saw in the church and there's things that I ha have held on to from the Methodists and the Pentecostals and then I got involved with the Catholics and uh, 
I worked with Mother Teresa because I started saying, who is somebody that's fleshing God's love out? And Mother Teresa was still alive. So we were 20 years old, you know, nothing's impossible. We just called India and she picked up the phone. I was calling from a payphone in our dormitory lounge at Eastern University. Young people, payphones were things you put quarter. Anyway, so, and the phone rang, and I was expecting a little, like, missionaries of charity, how can I help you? But I just heard, hello! And I was like, we're trying to uh, figure out how to follow Jesus. And we're trying to work with Mother Teresa or the nuns in India. Can you help a brother out? And she goes, yeah, this is Mother Teresa. And I, I was like, and I'm the Pope. Um, but we went and worked, and I mean, there's so many things I learned about being the church in India. But one of the things I was thinking about this morning, D.A., when we took communion, Mother Teresa wanted the Eucharist. She wanted to take communion every single morning, without exception. And we started asking one of the nuns, you know, uh, about that. And said, so why, why do we do communion every morning? And this Catholic sister said, well, you've heard that saying, you are what you eat. They're like, that's what we're going for. We're praying that we would become what we eat, that we would actually be transformed by the mystery of communion, that we would be transformed by the presence of Jesus. And the prayers that we prayed in India that I learned from Mother Teresa, every morning, this is the prayer that we would pray. May every person I come in contact with feel your presence in my soul, Jesus. And this is a prayer. May I leave off your fragrance everywhere I go, Jesus. That literally we are to be so filled with the Holy Spirit that we, uh, Jesus lives inside of us, right? That Paul would say, the life I live, I no longer live, but Jesus lives in me. That we are meant to be the presence of Jesus' love in the world. As my friend Stanley Hauerwas says, we are, are meant to be like air fresheners in the bathroom. Uh, we're meant to leave off the fragrance of Jesus' love. But I think we have to confess that sometimes the church has smelled like something else, right? Sometimes we haven't left off the fragrance of Jesus. In fact, the Barna Research Group, as you may know, the, you know, this really reputable research company, they went to every state in the United States a few years ago. And they asked young people, what do you think of when you hear the word Christian? What they found was heartbreaking. The number one answer of what young folks said they thought of when they hear the word Christian is anti-gay, anti-homosexual. Number two is judgmental. Number three is hypocritical. I'll stop there because the list doesn't get much better. And I think what it shows is that often we have become known more for who we've excluded than who we have embraced. We've often become known more for what we are against than what we are for. And what broke my heart as I read that list is what didn't make the list of what people said when they heard the word Christian. They didn't say love. And that's what Jesus said. They will know that you are Christians by your love. They didn't say the, the things that Scripture says. These are the fruits of the Spirit. Goodness, kindness, gentleness, uh, self-control, joy, right? These are the things that God is like. And so I began to realize that the church is often better at making believers than forming disciples. Okay. You know, the church that I grew up in so focused on the things that we believe that we've reduced Christianity to a doctrinal statement. But Jesus didn't come just to sign us up for a doctrinal statement. Somebody say amen. Jesus came to invite us into a revolution of God's love, of, of embodying God's love. And, and you can believe stuff without being filled with that love. Oh, Scripture says in Corinthians that we can speak in the tongues of men and of angels and do all sorts of miracles and prophecies. We can fathom all the depths of knowledge. But if we don't have love, if we don't have love, we can give all our money to the poor. But if we don't have love, we're just a gonging symbol. There's something empty inside of us. So 
We kept, I kept leaning in. You know, I, 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 I didn't give up on Jesus even uh, d- despite the shortcomings that I saw in the church. Now, some of y'all may have had a great experience in church. Bridgeway, you know, I know this is heaven on earth right here. But, you know, like, but there's a lot of contradictions. You know, as, as Mahatma Gandhi said, they asked him about Christianity. He said, I love Jesus. I just wish the Christians acted more like him. And Christians often act very unlike their Christ. And so I wanted a Christianity that looks like Jesus. And then, you know, here I am. I'm at a great Christian university. I'm studying the theology. I'm studying the Bible. But then where it really happened for me, where I really caught a vision for what it means to be the church, was in 1995, D.A., back in the 1900s. Come on, we had, we're sitting there in our lunchroom cafeteria, in our cafeteria on campus, and one of my friends gets the newspaper, and he throws down the newspaper, and he says, look at this. And it was a story of a group of homeless families in Philadelphia. These were homeless mothers and children. The fasting growing, the fastest growing homeless population in the U.S. is moms and kids, right? Still, still is and was then. And so they, uh, dozens and dozens of families were on the waiting list for housing. There were 3,000 families on the waiting list for housing in 1995. Ten-year waiting list. And so these families said, we cannot be invisible and we cannot be alone in our struggle. And so they looked around North Philadelphia and we've got abandoned buildings everywhere. But they found one in particular that struck them, an old abandoned Catholic church. And they looked at this building and they said, this isn't just any building, this is a sanctuary. And so they moved into it and they started living there. But what we read in the newspaper, it said this on the front line, the, the headline was, Church resurrected. And then it told the story of how over a hundred people, kids, families were living in this cathedral. But then as we kept reading, the end of the article said, and the archdiocese has given them 48 hours to get out. They gave them an eviction notice. If they weren't out within 48 hours, they could be arrested for trespassing on the church's property. Woo! That's one of those moments where, as good evangelicals, we had a prayer meeting, right? We decided to pray for the families. But I heard uh, uh, Dr. Anderson as clear as day when we prayed and we said, God, we need you to do something. We felt God say, I did do something. I made you. Get down there, right? Uh, you know, because there's those times where we're waiting on God and God might be waiting on us, right? That we, uh, as my, one of my mentors said, you ask God to move a mountain and God might give you a shovel, right? Uh, we are the hands and feet. And so we went down and we found that cathedral. And on the front of it, the families had hung a banner that said, how can we worship a homeless man on Sunday and ignore one on Monday? All the families held a press conference and they said, we mean no disrespect to the Catholic Church or the Archdiocese or the officials, but we've talked to the real owner of this building. And the Lord said, this is his house and we can stay. And they stayed for weeks and weeks. And and I got to tell you, it was in there that I felt church like I had never felt church before, right? We started reading about the early church in the book of Acts where it says all the believers were together and they shared everything they had and no one claimed any of their possessions were their own. It says that they they shared everything and there were no needy persons among them. It was about bearing one another's burdens. It was about worshiping the Lord together, right? It was this radical movement of community and solidarity. So now, 25 years later, ooh, oh, we, we've been building this little community inspired by the early church in the book of Acts. And we, we see some of those families that used to live in the cathedral. Their kids are all grown up now. And we're, doing, we're still doing that work together. But i got to say that I am concerned about a church that often deserts the very neighborhoods that Jesus would be moving into. 
Uh, my friend Derek Webb wrote a song that basis, basically says, God's been good. I've finally been able to move out of Jesus' neighborhood. Uh, it's a, it's a, 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 an indictment, I think, on a church that's often left the troubled neighborhoods. In Philadelphia, people know my neighborhood, Kensington, and they often call it the Badlands. But I say, you got to be careful if you call a place the Badlands, because that's exactly what they said about Nazareth, right? Nothing good could come from there, but look where sh God showed up. Right? God showed up in Nazareth, the Badlands. Uh, God shows up in those forsaken places. That's why I believe, like, as, as the church, we have to have a certain gravity towards the poor, towards the pain of the world, a, a, a gravity towards those neighborhoods that are, have often been divested from, people have moved out of. Uh, the Spirit is already at work there, and we get to see it every day on the north side of Philly. But I, I think as we think of uh, what it means to be the people of God, it's, 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 it's stunning to me because Scripture is so clear that Jesus' prayer for the church, the longest prayer recorded in Scripture, is that we would be one as God is one. Right? That, that we would be one. And yet it's also interesting that as you read the book of Corinthians, it talks about the body as one body, right, with many parts. But then it's very particular when it says some parts of the body have been dishonored. And so as you keep reading, it says, and God gives those parts of the body that have been dishonored special honor. Uh, my friend Alexia Salvatierra says uh, that is God's affirmative action. God is affirming what we have been slow to affirm. That's why uh, we can say black lives matter. Because history has rejected the full dignity and humanity of our African-American brothers and sisters. In the Dred Scott case, we said they don't have any rights that white people have to recognize. We said they're three-fifths human. And so there's a lot of people that are quick to say all lives matter, but have a real hard time saying black lives matter. Uh, my friend, uh, my, uh, I heard one uh, comedian say, uh, you know, if your wife comes up to you and says, baby, do you love me? You don't look back and say, Honey, I love everybody. Oh, there's something particular about God's love and God correcting the injustices of the world that we live in. So we need a church that, of course, can say every life is precious. Every human being is made in the image of God. But until we can say Palestinian lives matter, we don't really mean all lives matter. Until we can say black lives matter, until we can say those precious lives on the other side of the border wall are made in the image of God just as much as the folks born on this side. I've come to see, you know, I... That born again thing that the evangelical church brought me, I, I still believe in born, being born again. But I saw a pattern, right? Where every year we would go to these evangelical retreats and we would come to the altar and get born again again. <laughs> as our brother Tony Campolo said, we'd come to the altar singing just as I am and we would leave just as we were <laughs> and keep living just like we always have. But... There's something to being born again, if we really believe it, that says my love is bigger than biology. I have a fidelity that is bigger than patriotism because I believe that we are a part of a global family. And the Bible doesn't say God so loved America. It says God so loved the world. I want to love as big as God loves, don't you? And that's what it means to be the body of Christ in the world. We got a big human family. And part of our family's hurting right now. Our family in Gaza is hurting right now. Our family in Israel was attacked on October 7th. And every day since, a hundred lives have been taken in Gaza. And so we're hurting right now. Our friends on the border are hurting right now. I, uh, I was thinking of this. I've been to the West Bank, I've been to Hebron, I've been all over uh, Israel and Palestine, but I've also been to Iraq. And uh, I went to Iraq, as some of you may know, I went there to be a part of a presence for peace in the middle of the war. 
uh, in what was called the shock and awe campaign, right? 900 bombs a day were being dropped on Baghdad, and we lived in Baghdad. We were there to try to be a presence of peace and conscience and to stand against the war after 9-11. But I got to tell you, when it comes to thinking about what it means to be the church, everything got recalibrated like a GPS when I was in Iraq, right? Because I'm in Baghdad worshiping Jesus with thousands of Christians who were speaking Arabic. And they started singing Amazing Grace in Arabic, right? They, uh, they're worshiping the same Jesus, but in different tongues. And I, I got to tell you, I was so moved. I mean, the Holy Spirit came on this, um, this prayer meeting that we were in, and I got excited. You know, my Pentecostal self got excited. And I went up front, and I talked to the bishop afterwards, and I said, Bishop! I can feel the Holy Ghost in this place. And I said, and I got to tell you, I'm amazed because I didn't know that there were this many Christians in Iraq. And the bishop was gentle with me, but he said very sternly and uh, confidently, he said, son, this is where Christianity started. <laughs> and he said, look out the window. That's the Tigris River and the Euphrates. Have you read about them in the scripture? He said, the Garden of Eden was right around the corner. And then that bishop said to me, you didn't invent Christianity in North America. You just domesticated it. You colonized it. And he said, we are praying for the church in North America to remember who they are. They're praying for us. Our friends in Palestine are praying for us. If you haven't heard the sermon of Munther Isaac, we broadcast it uh, on Christmas. Ten million people around the world have now heard that sermon where he calls on us to be a conscience for peace right now, to be bridge builders, right, that are saying every life that was lost on October 7th in that vicious attack of Hamas was precious and made in the image of God, but no more precious than every child in Gaza right now. we got to be peacemakers because Jesus, Jesus blessed the peacemakers, not the war makers, right? We see what it means to be the church right now. I would suggest is what Dr. Martin Luther King said. I, I take a lot of cues from Dr. King. And, and he said, the church is not meant to be the master of the state. And the church is not meant to be the servant of the state. The church is meant to be the conscience of the state, the, the, the prophetic conscience of our nation. We're to stir people's hearts with compassion. We're to expose injustice and, and let the suffering speak so that people are moved to action. And that's what we've been, we've been praying for. We've been trying to be in Philadelphia. And, and uh, I'll tell you, it gets you in trouble. You know, sometimes uh, Philadelphia began to pass laws that... Uh, that d discriminated against the homeless, right? Anti-homeless laws have been passed all over this country, but Philadelphia began to pass some especially vicious ones. They made it illegal to sleep in public. They made it illegal to give out food, literally illegal to distribute food in downtown Philadelphia during, uh, for uh, many years. And so we decided, what does it mean to be the conscience of our city? And we said, we've got to share food with the hungry because Jesus said, when I was hungry, did you feed me? So we started, we wanted to have humility, right? We didn't want to come across as too pre pretentious, but we knew we needed to challenge those laws. So we, we had worship services downtown in Love Park. We bought, brought our guitars and our drums and then we... Um, after worship, we serve communion like we had this morning, which is tricky because you're not allowed to give out food. And all the cops are around. They're like, I'm not arresting them during communion. In fact, I might need to take communion up in here. You know? and, and after communion, we kept breaking the bread by bringing in some pizzas and stuff. You know? and, and eventually, we were arrested. We were arrested. My mom was not pleased with this, right? That's why it's so funny to me when I meet Christians, sometimes they're like, my life was such a mess. They tell me their testimony. You know, I went to jail. I did all kinds of drugs. I did all this stuff. And then I met Jesus. 
I'm like, God bless you if that's your story and testimony. But mine is I pretty much had my life together, and then I met Jesus, and he messed me up. That's where the trouble started. I didn't go, I didn't go to jail, brother, before I was a Christian, but I've been a whole lot of time since. Let me tell you, because there's some stuff worth going to jail over these days. As, as John Lewis said, that's why we can smile in our mugshot, because we know we're on the right side of history. So we went to trial, D.A., we went to trial, and uh, I, I can't tell you the whole story, but there's about 30 of us that got arrested. In fact, some of my friends on the street got arrested and had no intention to, but we got sucked up. The police surrounded all of us, put us in handcuffs, took us to jail. So we had to argue our case in court, and there's that beautiful scripture. It says, don't worry what you're going to say when you come before the magistrates, right? The Spirit will give you the words. So we say, give us the words, Lord. And we decided, we had all our lawyer friends that showed up. I'm grateful for good lawyers. Hallelujah. But we decided we need our, just one of the guys on the street to, to be our spokesperson because this is his struggle. And, and we need not to be a voice for him. We need his voice to be heard. So our buddy Alfonso agreed to represent us. We all knew him as Fonz because he's smooth talking, you know. And, uh, and so we go to trial. And I have a shirt on that says, Jesus was homeless. And the first thing the judge does, he goes, come here. Jesus was homeless. I didn't know that. And I said, yeah, your honor. In the scripture, Jesus says, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. And the judge said, you guys might stand a chance. And we did. Uh, Fonzo, Fonzo stood up and he said, your honor, on behalf of the group, I'd like to say we believe these laws are evil and wrong. And we rest our case. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah, bless him, you know. And uh, the di district attorney wanted us to go to jail and serve time. I mean, she was throwing the book at us. She wanted us to uh, uh, have, this was the kicker, hours and hours of mandatory court-sanctioned community service. <laughs> like, Don't make us feed the homeless, you know. So here we go. We, uh, we, we argue our case. And the judge interrupts the whole court. And the judge says in the middle of the trial, listen. You don't have to convince me that these people broke the law. It's clear to me that they've been breaking the law. He said, the question is, what about the laws that we're passing in this city that hurt our most vulnerable people? And he said, let me remind the court, if it weren't for people who broke the bad laws, we wouldn't have the freedom that we have. That's what this country's built on from the Boston Tea Party to the Civil Rights Movement. He said, uh, have you heard of the Underground Railroad? And the judge said... These guys are not criminals. They're freedom fighters. I find them all not guilty on every charge. And then the judge said, and how can I get one of those t-shirts? So we sent him a t-shirt. But I want to tell you, I learned in all of that, that part of what it means to be the church, the church in the world is that we are to be that conscience we're to be a prophetic presence in the world, right? And uh, my friend Walter Brueggemann, he's written great works on this, uh, the prophetic imagination. He says, sometimes we misunderstand the prophets, the biblical prophets. We think that they were fortune tellers trying to predict the future. But Dr. Brueggemann says, no, 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 that's not it. The, the, the prophets weren't fortune tellers they were truth tellers. And they were not trying to predict the future. They were trying to change it by waking us up to the presence and saying, can you imagine a different world? Can you imagine a world where we beat our swords into plows and our spears into pruning hooks? Amen. So that's what inspired us. We started a few years ago. We said we ain't got many spears in Philadelphia. But we got way too many guns. We have more guns than people in the United States. And so we said, let's start beating some guns into garden tools. And we started doing it, y'all. You, know, you might know this is, a, this is a shovel made out of a gun. And I tell my evangelical friends, DA, that this is what a gun looks like when it gets born again. Uh, all things can be made new. And my cross... Uh, you know, it's a little conspicuous. It's a big cross, but this is made out of the barrel of a gun. And uh, Senator also Brooks got a little heart. I'm Senator, uh, you know, uh, Senator 
possible, uh, but we, we, we're looking, we're naming it and claiming it. She got a, uh, a heart made out of the barrel of a gun because we're saying all things can be made new. Metal that has been crafted to kill can be recrafted to curate life. And what's true of metal is also true of human flesh, that someone who has killed somebody is more than the worst thing that they've ever done. They also are a precious child of God. And God's love is big enough to heal both the victims and the victimizers. Somebody say amen. God's love is big enough to heal both the oppressed and the oppressors. That's why we are bridge builders, right? We believe that God's love is bigger than we can ever imagine. So let me just close by saying, in the end, I think the things that we believe are very important. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and died for our sins and rose from the dead. I believe the core tenets of the Christian faith. But I also know that in the end, if Jesus is right, in Matthew 25, all of us are going to be gathered before God. And we're going to be asked a few questions. And the questions according to Jesus are not just doctrinal questions. It's not just that God's going to go, okay, Virgin birth. Agree, disagree, or strongly disagree. <laughs> we might wish it was a theology test. Because we'd all do good on a theology test. But no, the questions we will be asked are, when I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was in prison, did you come visit me? When I was a stranger, when I was, let me make it plain, when I was an immigrant, when I was a refugee, when I was on the streets and down and out, did you take care of me? Did you welcome me in? Maybe God will ask the children of Gaza who the peacemakers are. Because when we do it to the least of these, we do it under Christ. Now, I want to say this morning, our works do not earn our salvation, but our works demonstrate our salvation. If we do not see our faith manifest itself in good news to the least of these, then we might be believers in Jesus, but not yet followers. So I want to say this morning, Jesus didn't come to make believers. Jesus came to make disciples. Maybe you grew up in the church and you believe all the right things but you just haven't quite leaned into the suffering of the world I want to say this morning let's recommit ourselves to be disciples of Jesus to be a part of the con carne incarnation of God's love in the world let me pray for us oh God oh God thank you for this community where we can humbly seek you. Thank you for all that you've done here at Bridgeway over the years, over the decades. Thank you for how your love flows out of this place. And I pray for each and every one of this this morning, those listening online, that we would whisper hear the whisper of your love for us and that that love would transform us that we might become a part of your body that we might leave off your fragrance your love in the world and I pray oh God that a generation from now when people hear the word Christian they will not first think anti-gay, judgmental, and hypocritical, and all those things. But we pray that they would say love, that they would say justice. Those are the folks that are taking care of the people no one else cares about. May it be so. Thank you, Lord. I pray all this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Shane Claiborne. I told you he got his own office. He's got his own office. Man. Thank you, brother. Not just for the word today. You can take your seats. Not just for the word today, 
but for the way you've lived your life over the years and all these years we've known each other to watch you live your life as a single man for so long. But then you ended up finding a little shorty somewhere. Yeah. Uh huh. I didn't know we were going there this uh-huh. morning. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. On, t- t- <clears throat> Tell us about Shawty. Well, so I, I, I met this uh, wonderful woman, Katie Jo, in Philly. She's a North Carolinian, by the way, but that don't matter. But anyway, we fell in love, been married 10 years, and then after, actually, after 12 years, we didn't think we could have kids and got pregnant this year, got a little one month old baby. That's why he's a little, <laughs> he's a little too young to be able to bring to church. Right, but, right. They're with, they're with me down here and, uh, and a part of the Bridgeway family. So our little boy, Elijah, Elijah Allen, is uh, five weeks old right now. So. Man, can you imagine? So he is now a, a husband, a father. I met little Elijah. He's so, he's so cute. And I just want to pray for you and your family. Man, you just rocked that message. I mean, you could have dropped the mic. I'm glad you didn't because it cost too much. But just the fact that you, you could have, man, I just thank you, my brother. Can you all just extend a hand in prayer? Lord Jesus. Jesus, as we uh, even lay hands on Shane and the work he's doing, not only in Philadelphia, but around the world, as we extend our hands from Owens Mills, Reisterstown, from Columbia, and from all over the earth, we just want to thank you, God, for reminding us of why we are the church, because of love and justice and not because of the things we're against or the people we exclude. Help us, Lord Jesus. We need you, and we need the voice of Shane Claiborne. So cover him, cover Katie, and cover little baby Eli. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Together, everyone said amen and amen.